Boris Johnson has caused constant headlines, especially for the past few weeks, or days really, uh, from lying to Parliament about breaking Covid rules, to resigning in a fit of anger, from be- breaking ministerial code with his new job at the Daily Mail. It seems to me he's an avid rule breaker who's just, who sees a future of the nation as just fun and games really. What do you think of him and do you think he can get back into politics? I think that his behaviour has been very narcissistic, very self-centred. He's incapable of saying sorry and he's causing immense damage to the party he claims to care about. And the problem is, when it becomes about an individual, not about the cause or the country or the people or even one's own party, then clearly he's lost the plot. Rishi Sunak must be tearing his hair out because this is dominating the news, and the perception of the average member of the public is of a divided party that's distracted from the cost of living crisis, distracted from the big issues of the day, whether it be Ukraine or the NHS, And it's doing them tremendous brand damage. And, and, you know, the end of the day, if there was an election tomorrow, there would be a landslide defeat for the Conservative Party. Now, as it so happens, there isn't an election tomorrow. So Rishi Sunak has got to hope that the economy improves, that Boris shuts up and his wing of the party unite behind his leadership, uh, and that most people feel the country is improving to have any chance of avoiding landslide. Do you think the Conservative would lose because of this? Absolutely. Just, the the oh. history of... Well, there are, there, are, there are many reasons why yeah. they would lose. I mean, one is because the history of divided parties is the public punishes divided parties at general elections, without any question. Yeah. Uh, secondly, people are deeply unhappy with the cost of living challenges that they face and are not yet convinced the government is doing nothing, enough about them and believes actually Liz Truss probably contributed to some of that, so it's not just simply world events. The NHS is increasingly on a daily basis. There are horror stories up and down the country in every community about people's experiences accessing a GP appointment, waiting for hours in A&E. Uh, And then there's this constant distraction about personalities, not about the issues that matter to the people. And the final point I would make is this. Keir Starmer's Labour Party doesn't frighten people right now. So they feel they can take a chance and give the other uh, team an an opportunity without risking the economy or risking national security. Because Keir Starmer is moderate, he's middle of the road, nobody can claim he's a radical lefty like Jeremy Corbyn. So, so the, the the risk of change is less dangerous. If, so if, it's a combination. If the Conservative Party get rid of Boris, or the, which is sort of they're trying to do, wouldn't that then you've got a moderate versus a moderate? Isn't Rishi and say Keir Starmer the same sort of personalities? In some ways, yeah. I, I think that's a fair observation. The the question is that there's been so much damage done. Yeah that it's very hard to see how Rishi can win the next election. The question is, can he avoid a landslide defeat, which means that Labour could be in power for a generation? That's how high the stakes are for the Conservative Party. You asked me about Boris Johnson's future. I I think, you know, I'll be very frank with you. You can never rule this man out. And what I mean is, a scenario where they lose the next election, um, the Conservative members are very angry at losing the next election, but they don't lose it by that much. Rishi Sunak probably, if they lose under any circumstances, will have to resign. Boris Johnson will not become the leader of the Conservative opposition immediately. He'll want to see whether there's any prospect of the Conservatives getting back into government. Uh, but just say Labour faced made many challenges in, in its first term of government, things were not going that well. Of course you can never write Boris Johnson off. But at the moment, it's not just that the political commentators are slamming uh, Boris Johnson. It's the public have had enough. They've really had enough. But what I'm interested by in my conversations over the last few days, the party members are still in denial. Many of them still believe that Boris Johnson is a victim of unfairness. He's been badly treated. He's been singled out. They don't get it. They don't get it, in my opinion. So that's a real problem for the Tories, because if all their problems are to do with, as they see it, a plot from Remainers or civil servants or a people who are out to get them, they will never face up to the truth, the reality. And what do I mean by that? Let's go through these different stages. What, what, what caused this in the first place? It was the leaking of information about those parties by Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings led the Leave campaign. This can't be a conspiracy by Remainers. Secondly, 50 ministers in Boris Johnson's own government resigned. It never happened in history. In one night, wasn't it? Yeah, as well. yeah. because they believed, not just because of Partygate, yeah. they believed that the government was in complete 
shambles. Okay. And the final point I would make is this committee of the House of Commons that's made this judgment about Boris Johnson is a conservative majority committee. Although it's chaired by Harriet Harman, that is true. The majority of MPs on it that had to, had to vote in favour of the recommendations to exclude Boris Johnson for, I think, 90 days uh, are conservatives. So, so they, they have this... It's a bit like Trump in America. Anything, anytime anything goes wrong, it's a massive conspiracy uh, against them by the establishment or the civil service or the liberals or the woke or the anti, you know, or the, or, 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 or the woke brigade. And, and, and if that's the mindset you're in, you're never going to face up to your problems. You're never going to admit you've created some of them and you need to change what you're doing. And the final point I would make is there are some who would say that Rishi Sunak brought Boris Johnson down. If you remember, it was Rishi Sunak who made that speech in the House of Commons along with Sajid Javid, which provoked those resignations. But let's not forget, Rishi Sunak was a Brexiteer. He wasn't a Remainer. So this obsession that the Conservative Party, certainly the right wing of the Conservative Party has, that they justify what's happening to Boris as all about because Boris took the establishment on, all because Boris led uh, the Leave campaign. It's just deluded. Why, why is it like that? Why is many members of the Conservative Party don't actually see what the rest of the public see? I think because having been in politics all my life, people become very tribal. And when you become tribal, you lose all sense of perspective. And yeah. objectivity. I think that that's uh, one reason. Uh, some people, I think, would point to Boris Johnson's achievements yeah. uh, and say he didn't deserve this, it's disproportionate. And I think the problem with that is, I particularly think he deserves credit for Ukraine. I think he really did show leadership and the rest of the West followed. So he does, he does deserve tremendous credit for that. I don't care what anybody says. Okay. Uh, but the problem is, the party gate stuff just simply exposed what he's done for much of his career, which he's been less than truthful. Now, that's me being a politician being very nice. uh, when, I, when I say that. <laughs> so it's flushed out one of his great weaknesses. And we have a concept in Judaism called teshuva, which means that if you make mistakes, because we all make mistakes, none of us are perfect, if you genuinely are sorry and say you're sorry and promise not to do it again, you often get forgiven. Boris Johnson and Donald Trump have that in common. They are incapable of sincerely saying, sorry, I got it wrong, and I realise I have to change because I can't behave like this if I want people to support me. Incapable. So it's all of those factors uh, that are at play. And I think that the other thing is, without all of this, the Conservative Party has been in power a long time since 2010, initially with the Lib Dems, latterly on their own. And the pe people are always instinctively saying, maybe it's time for a change, providing the opposition are electable. This has made that 10 times worse, the events of the last uh, 18 months. The disarray over Boris's uh, resignation, the uh, d disastrous short period that Liz Truss spent um, as a, a prime minister. And I think that there is... Some respect for Rishi Sunak in the sense that people feel at last we have a grown up back running the country. OK, um, and we needed some level of stability and he has brought that stability. But that in itself will not be enough to stop the Labour Party winning the next election. By the way, the question is for me whether it will be a very large majority or whether it will be a much tighter election than it appears at the moment. And there's still plenty of time. The Conservative Party does not need to go to the country uh, till, um, I think it's early 2024, probably, or is it early 2025 even? Probably, 20, yeah, uh, one of them. Yeah, I think it's early 2025. Mm -hmm. So there is a very, very long period ahead um, where anything can happen. Uh, a week is a long time in politics is a favourite expression of history. But let me be clear about this. They can't blame anybody else other than themselves. They got a tremendous majority in 2019. Okay? A tremendous majority. Boris Johnson was extremely popular. Yeah. We shouldn't forget that. Uh, he won votes for the Conservative Party of voters who had never voted Conservative before. The Labour Party was in disarray. Yeah? Four years on, they've thrown it all away. And it's quite extraordinary that they've done that. And they've only got themselves... Uh, to blame, frankly, for that. And the question is, what are they going to do next? The Labour Party also has challenges. I don't want to pretend otherwise. The Labour Party has got to inspire people with an agenda for the future of the country. They've got to continue to reassure part, uh, people that they're not Jeremy Corbyn's Labour, that they've not only rid themselves of anti-Semitism, but they've rid themselves of being a threat to the economy or a threat to national security. Now, 
How well has Keir Starmer done? I think in terms of reassuring people that his party, Labour Party, is different than Corbyn's Labour Party, I think he's done quite well. In terms of uh, is the average voter scared of the prospect of a Keir Starmer-led government? No. But he's still got a lot to do on inspiring people that the Labour Party genuinely has a positive vision for the future of the country and a solution to some of the problems. At the end of the day, uh, people are really struggling you know, to feed their kids, to pay the bills. Uh, and alongside that, the NHS appears to be in meltdown. So these are the big issues um, where Labour still has, uh, you know, a job to do. And of course, Scotland, it all remains to be seen at the moment, is playing into Labour's hands, the decline of the SNP. Um, that, we, it remains to be seen how all of that plays out in the next 12 or 18 months.